Warning. The Foundation database is classified. Unauthorized access will result in detainment. Within this archive, you'll find the procedures, descriptions, and accounts of the most notorious anomalies we've encountered to date. Secure. Contain. Protect. Item number, SCP-1730. Containment class, neutralized. Special containment procedures. A circular perimeter has been established two kilometers from SCP-1730, and a quarantine zone has been established one kilometer from SCP-1730. Personnel who are to enter SCP-1730 must first undergo class seven hazardous contact preparation measures including the application of a modified Maxwell hardened hazardous material reinforced airtight suit. The application of these protective measures may only take place at the provisional Site 23 quarantine main gate. Individuals attempting to exit the quarantined area must first submit through decontamination protocol as administered by the quarantine security staff. Individuals failing to meet the quarantine extraction perimeters are to be held for further decontamination or, in the event decontamination becomes unfeasible, termination. Containment Update 1-17-2016 Dangerous biological and cognitohazardous entities have resulted in high casualties of security rescue teams. Mobile Task Force Zeta-9, Mole Rats, have been assigned to all current exploration efforts. Containment Update 2-1-2016 Due to information gathered by Foundation surveillance teams, exploration and recovery efforts into Site-13 are no longer indefinitely suspended. Details will be available on a need-to-know basis. Assigned mobile task force units will be alerted by their superior officers. Containment Update 5-15-2017 Mobile Task Force Apollo 3, Game Wardens, and Tau-5, Samsara, are activated and assigned to exploration of SCP-1730. See Addendum 1730.8 for details. Containment Update 6 2017 Due to the events detailed in Addendum 1730.9, SCP-1730 has been reclassified as neutralized. Additional research efforts are ongoing. Notice: The following documents are as SCP-1730 appeared before its reclassification is neutralized. Some inconsistencies may persist. Description: SCP-1730 is a large complex of structures, 15 kilometers northwest of the U.S.-Mexico border within Big Bend Ranch State Park that was discovered on June 5, 2015. Due to the isolated nature of the complex and the low survival rate of individuals who've come in contact with it, it is possible that SCP-1730 had been previously discovered but unreported. SCP-1730 bears identifying marks and contains documents to support the claim that SCP-1730 was at one point Foundation Site 13, originally located near Nome, Alaska. This conflicts with current records, which showed that Site-13 was a project that, while intended to be constructed in Nome, was scrapped for the larger and more advanced Site-19 and never completed. Flora located on-site had been tracked back to those native to the Alaskan region. How SCP-1730 came to be at its current location is unknown. SCP-1730 is in a severe state of disrepair and appears to have been left abandoned for an extended period of time. The site power generators continue to operate in a damaged state Despite a number of fuel leaks and fires throughout the facility, this has resulted in intermittent power failures throughout the site, hindering exploration and rescue efforts. The origin of SCP-1730 is unknown, as is the nature of many of the anomalous entities contained within. It is confirmed that the 2nd through 15th basement levels were utilized for entity containment, though the state of that containment has deteriorated significantly. It is believed that a contingent of human survivors exists somewhere deep in the lower basement levels of the facility. Messages written in English have been discovered throughout the site, consisting of warnings such as danger and death here, and other messages such as not my body and bleed. A recurring message, what happened to site 13, has been found in several different locations in the basements. Several logs of data have been collected by the remaining functional site terminals, the relevant data of which is contained in the addendums below. Worth noting is that inconsistencies exist between the logs and what has been determined through exploration, including site layout, staff makeup, and contained anomalies. Addendum 1730.1 Recovered Log 
1 12 2016. Team Mobile Task Force D12, codename Mudslingers. Assignment Site 13 Recovery. Lead D12 Alpha. We found it. Watched it kill Daly earlier. Crawled right into his mouth, and next thing you know, Daly's got blood leaking out of his ears. Puking it up, shitting it out everywhere. Blood looked funny, too. Too dark. He was running out of his hair, like through the follicles. His hair fell out right with it. Once it was over, the thing that crawled inside him crawled back out with a buddy. One of them, can't say which, drinks up all this blood like a leech. The other one crawls back inside daily and he stands up, turns around and starts coming at us. I can see the thing inside him when he opens his mouth. So I put a bullet in his face. And another. We emptied our magazines into him. He didn't get up after that. We're not going to be too much longer, though. We found another one of those messages down here. You know, just a matter of time before it starts. We strapped some C4 to it and blew the wall, and I think it's pretty illegible at this point. But it doesn't matter. Jones already went quiet like the others. We shoved him down an elevator shaft earlier. Didn't hear the body hit the ground. I think I just heard them start up Thresher. Wish we would have known about that sooner. Oh well. Addendum 1730.2 Recovered automated message. The following message was recovered from SCP 1730's emergency warning system. Logs on file indicate it was transmitted moments prior to a major electrical disturbance and three minutes before an explosion within the site power relay. General notice Site 13 has experienced a gross breach of containment systems. Why is breach containment during testing? On site nuclear device is non responsive. Thresher protocol has been activated. Addendum 1730.3 Exploration Logs. Exploration Log 1 Team Mobile Task Force D12, code name Mudslingers. Assignment Site 13 Exploration. Lead D12 Alpha. Quarters on. Everybody check your mics. Check. Check. And check makes four. Right. Command, you hear us loud and clear? Roger that, team lead. All right. Keep weapons locked. No idea what we're going to see in there. Yep, we're set. Let's move in. Those doors. Keep your eyes open. Dark in here. Switching lights. Good call. There's something written on the wall over here. Yeah, here too. What you got? Uh, get below and uh, don't look at the walls uh, next to it. Little late for that. You see that, Command? Yes. All right, let's move on out. Service elevator over there. Bravo. Check if it has power. Yup, this'll work. Let's see how far down it'll take us then. And away we go. The door opens to reveal a dark hallway. A single light is on at the bend in the hall roughly 50 meters from the elevator. Okay, let's clear this level first. Then we can go from there. Bravo, take that hallway there. Charlie can check the rooms in this hallway. Delta and I will stay here, make sure our elevator sticks around. Team splits up. D-12 Bravo moves towards the light at the end of the hallway. D-12 Charlie begins checking on rooms on the left and right sides of the hallway. D-12 Alpha periodically checks in on both team members. Rooms are filthy. What is this? Yeah, I see it too. Is it mud? Feels like it. Some kind of sludge. Hmm. <laughs> smells metallic. I'll send this back up, Site Command. Let you guys poke around in it. Acknowledged. Try and keep out of it as much as you can until we figure out what it is. Sure thing. I'm at the end of this hallway. Another hallway here. Looks like some kind of barricade at the end. 
Bunch of tables and desks all piled up over there. Can you approach the barricade, Bravo? Yuck. More of the sludge in this room. Caked on the walls. Ooh, found a body. Hang tight, Delta. Don't move. I'm heading towards Charlie. D-12 enters the room. A visible humanoid body is seen half-submerged in the thick black material in the corner. The head and neck are not visible. Yeah. Any kind of identification? He's got a spot on his belt for a badge, but it's missing. Looks pulled off. Maybe to unlock a door somewhere? Maybe. Bravo, go ahead and proceed. Aye, aye. Alpha. It's more bodies here. That sludge is all over the back of this barricade. Shit, that one moved. There's something else in this damn pile. Get a light on it! Moving your way, Bravo. Ah, there! Fuck! Bravo. Bravo, report. Something crawled out of one of their mouths. Some kind of snake, I think. Like, had a lot of teeth. Can't really tell what the hell it is now. Shit. The body where I shot it is hollow. You see in this command? Affirmative. All right. Watch for that then, I guess. Weapons hot. If they aren't already. Aye, aye. Let's head back to the elevator. See if we can't get down to the next level. D-12 Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie begin to retrace their steps. Wait a second. Didn't we turn this left earlier? Sure fucking did. Where's the elevator? <sighs> Here we go. Shut it, all right? Command, you read us? Sure do, Captain. Where's the elevator? Should be about 45 meters to your 12. There's a wall here. Looks like it's always been here. Either we're hallucinating or the building is doing something funky. Any chance you can reach Delta? A moment. No go. Ah, shit. All right, let's find another way out of here then. D-12 team proceeds down the hallway. Notably. The hallway is much longer than any hallway seen on recovered schematics of the site. I'm seeing something else on this door. What's that? It says silence. We trying to check this? Not a containment cell, right? Just another office door? This whole floor just looks like offices. All right, then. Get in there. Uh, it's locked. I can't get it open. Knock the door down, then. You hear that? One. Two. D-12 Bravo kicks down the door. Video records three frames of a naked human with what appears to be fire burning out of its ears, staring fearfully at the door. There's an intense white light and the sound of searing meat. All camera lenses are damaged and become non-functional. All microphones, except for that on D-12 Charlie, stop working. What happened? Alpha? D-12 team? Site Command attempts to communicate with D-12 team for an additional 30 seconds before realizing that D-12 Charlie's mic is still operational. D-12 Charlie, can you hear us? This continues for 43 seconds. D-12 Charlie! A dull, low, approaching sound accompanies this. D-12 Alpha, Bravo, anyone? Mic cuts out suddenly. D-12 is unresponsive. Oh, shit. Hey, Site Command... D-12 Delta, where are you right now? By the elevator. I assumed our radios had just stopped working down here. I'm just waiting for everyone else to get back. The rest of the team is compromised. Hang on. We're trying to establish a link to your video. Oh, uh, no need for that. It's probably just interference. Can you send a, can you send a team down here to get me? Hang on. Video coming up. Got it. You... Mounted cameras on Delta's equipment have seemingly been discarded and changed locations. Instead of the hallway Delta was last reported in, the camera feed shows a large utility room. Boilers are visible in the near distance, and a wall appears to have been caved in. The camera is looking up at D-12 Charlie. The camera is looking up at D-12 Charlie, who appears to be hanging upside down. Their features are stark white and unmoving. Their face is covered in blood that looks to have originated from their mouth, nostrils, and eyes. A large object is seen moving quickly behind D-12 Charlie, accompanied by the sound of slithering from many different sources. D-12 
D12 Charlie opens their eyes. Two frames later, the video and audio feeds cut out. No additional responses are picked up from the D12 team. Exploration Log 3. Team. Mobile Task Force Y-24. Codename. Gulliver's Travelers. Assignment. Site 13 Continued Exploration. Lead. Y-24 Arizona. Note. Initial exploration of the main site structure proved too dangerous for an additional attempt without additional resources. The only remaining mobile task force on hand was MTF Y-24, a three-man team who is charged with entering the site power station and assessing the damage. Coming online. Video and audio feeds for all three members come online. Ahead of them is the entrance to the SCP-1730 power station. You can hear us? Affirmative. Good. Anything we should know? Thermal scans read one of the cores as being superheated. Might be on the verge of an explosion. Stay as far away from them as you can. You can use the micro drones if you need to. Don't worry about trying to get them back. Right. Okay, good. Let's get on. Y24 team enters power station. First room appears to be a security station. There's our first problem. Doors are locked. Hmm. These are pretty solid, too. Is that glass bulletproof? Check it. Ja. Yes, that answers that. Command, are we cleared to use explosives in here? Negative. Structure is pretty weak all over. You'll risk caving yourself in. Well, shit. There's no other way in. Hang on. We have anybody on site with a level 4 clearance card? One that can override breach lockdowns. Dr. Edwards is with a team over at the containment bay. No, no, it'd have to be somebody older. Edwards has only been around for like, what, 10 years? Somebody who's had the clearance for a long time. Stand by. Director Jameson is currently on assignment at Site 65. Eh, that's three hours from here. We won't... No, you've got the right idea. Get Director Jameson on the phone, Command. Ask him what his clearance code was in... When was Site 19 built? 1960. Stand by. All right, you ready? Go ahead. Delta Alpha 7899. Well, I'll be damned. Hello, Researcher Jameson. Will you look at that? We'll send the director your regards. Please do. Good work, one. Let's get in here. Can you see the damaged core? No. They all look fine. Let's switch to the thermal lens. There it is. Are we missing something? That core looks fine. We need to get closer to it, guys. Right. Releasing microdrone command. Y24 Arizona releases a microdrone. Drone approaches power station cores and begins to circle them. Twelve cores are accounted for. Seven of them are damaged beyond repair. Three have not been brought up to power, and two are operational at full capacity which, aside from its abnormal temperature, shows no other signs of damage. It looks fine. Can you get closer to that, Captain? Sure. Y-24 team approaches the superheated core. Temperature readings begin to rise as they grow closer. What's this shit? It's really thick. Is that sludge? Some kind of waste? Try and avoid that, team. Captain, can you get a vial of it on the microdrone and send it back out the way you came? Yeah, hang on. Two, grab one if... Yeah, you've got it. Sample's on the way, Command. Thanks. Be careful, guys. Try and get around to the other side of it. I'm over here. Nothing looks... Oh, fuck. Look. Jesus. Y-24 camera shows no fewer than ten human bodies, bound to the side of the superheated core with wire. All of the bodies appear similar to the bodies found by D-12 team. Stark white, blood leaking from all orifices, and non-responsive. Something written underneath them. Is that blood? What happened to Site-13? These lines don't run to the main structure. See here? They're running below us. Any kind of identifier? Let me see. Yeah, 
are all labeled body pit. They run straight into the ground over there. Looks like we're going below then. Command, you copy all that? We do. Just received your sample back as well. Going to get a report on that in just a few minutes. All right, good. Let's get down there. There's a stairwell over here. Y-24 team approaches stairwell and begins to descend. Lighting zaps in the stairwell and all team members switch on their shoulder lights. This has been pried open. Looks like somebody was trying to get out? Not in. Uh, something else written on the wall here. Fuck SCP. <laughs> That's polite. You smell that? <laughs> Fuck, yeah. That's disgusting. What is it? Whatever is on the other end of this hall, I'd imagine. Watch the blown radiator here, guys. Team, take note that we are losing video feed. Something's interfering with our signal here. Roger that. We... Audio feed cuts out. Positioning system stays active for a few more moments, as Site Command attempts to reconnect with Y-24 team. Intermittent communications are received for an additional 15 minutes. Some of these are human. That same... It's all over the inside. That black shit. Smells like iron. Something crawled out. Look. D do you hear that? We need to get... There's a light over there. Can you see it? Hello? Are you okay? Do you need help? We can get you. Audio cuts completely. Recovered efforts are halted. No communications are received from Y24 team for an additional 24 hours. After which, the team is determined to be lost. Samples that were returned with the micro drone are revealed to be blood and power core residual runoffs, mixed with an unknown kind of additional biological matter. Study into the substance is ongoing. After one week, Y24 Arizona's video feed became active again for 13 seconds. No audio is transmitted, and the video shows a group of humans standing in a circle, looking down at a table. Exploration Log 6. Team, Mobile Access Drone. Assignment, Site 13 Drone Exploration. Notes, while waiting for additional resources to arrive at SCP-1730, an unmanned ground-based drone was launched into the main site complex through the same door that the D-12 team had entered. The planned goal of the mission was to investigate lower floors and attempt to recover information relating to the origins of SCP-1730. Drone enters the elevator and turns to the floor selection. There are selections for five floors above the ground level and 15 below. Drone moves to select B-15 level. Elevator begins to descend. After seven floors, the elevator suddenly stops. After a few moments of time, it is determined this is due to an intermittent power failure. Drone uses suitable utility to open the forward-facing elevator door. The open elevator shaft is visible, and the drone is unable to determine the depth of the shaft. Using its winch, the drone descends below the stopped elevator to the first available floor. After prying open the door, the drone swings in the opening and retracts the winch. A sign on the wall just inside the doorway indicates that this is the 8th basement level, and that it is a Euclid-class containment wing. Lights on this floor remain dark. The drone is instructed to move down the main hallway and look for a suitable area to descend to the next floor. Drone moves towards a side hallway and is instructed to explore down it. It is noted that a number of messages are written on the walls, including, don't look at the walls, and kill the quiet ones. After inspecting a number of rooms and finding them to be only empty offices, the drone returns to the main hallway. Drone ceases movement upon seeing a large, vaguely humanoid entity standing near the end of the hallway. This entity appears to glide slowly down the hallways, seemingly not noticing the drone. After it passes, the drone is instructed to follow the entity. The entity enters a maintenance closet near the end of the initial hallway. Drone observes as the entity extends a long arm from beneath its outer layer and touches the floor. Upon further observation, 
the entity is noted to have picked up some of the thick, dark material previously identified as blood and power station runoff, with what is identified as its primary finger appendage. The entity then begins to make slow movements toward the wall behind it. This is obscured from the drone's view. The entity ceases movement, and then slowly turns to leave the room. The drone is instructed to move towards the wall and take note of any changes. It is noted that the entity left behind a number of unique symbols, such as, what happened to Site-13. The drone takes several flash photographs of these symbols and transmits them back to Site Command. Drone is then instructed to continue to follow the large entity. However, the entity has disappeared from the hallway. It is noted that the entity left no apparent footprints, even in the thick material covering parts of the floor. Drone is instructed to continue on regardless. Drone reaches what appears to be a series of several containment cells. The first cell is open. A placard on the side of the doorway reads, Entity 324, scheduled for termination, 12-13-1975. The drone enters the doorway and observes a spacious containment cell. Thick rubber padding is all along the walls. The drone notices a human form in the corner of the room, covered in thick, dark sludge. As the drone approaches the form, small sparks fire from its fingertips toward the drone. The drone takes several photographs, then leaves. The next three cells are all empty with no placards. The fourth cell is closed, and its placard is smashed. The drone is instructed to attempt to open the door with its cutting torch. After a few moments, it is able to do so. The drone enters the room. In the corner of the room is the emaciated body of a human female, roughly aged 34 years. The body shows no sign of life. A chain is seen around the neck, descending into the shirt. Notable is the lack of sludge within this cell, possible as a result of the inhabitant closing the door and locking it from the interior. The drone searches the corpse for an identification badge and finds one. The name reads, Jack Bright. Drone is then instructed to search the neck chain, but the chain is discovered to be broken. The drone then leaves this room. The drone traverses a short way until it finds a stairwell. The drone descends to the next floor. A sign by the doorway reads, fifth floor. The drone turns to view the stairwell it had previously descended from, but finds it non-existent. After some short discussion at Site Command, the drone is instructed to enter the doorway. The drone enters into a large, spacious office floor lit by sunlight. Several terminals are nearby, though all of them have been destroyed. The drone approaches the least damaged terminal and attempts to power it on. The terminal does not power on, though whether this is due to a power outage or damage to the machine is unknown. The drone maneuvers across the room. Papers litter the floor, and many look to have been burned or shredded. The drone reaches a terminal labeled M. Hadley, which appears mostly undamaged and attempts to power it on. The terminal powers on, and the drone then attempts to connect with the computer. The computer is running the same foundation-based system as the current model, albeit a number of generations older. The drone is instructed to transmit every file it is capable of accessing to Site Command. The drone begins to do this. Note. At this point in the operation, Site Command lost contact with the drone. Several members of the operation team suddenly showed symptoms of some kind of anomalous influence, growing silent and beginning to burn from their ears. After the onset of symptoms, any sound would trigger what appeared to be a silent explosion that shook Site Command and destroyed most of its communicative equipment. It was later discovered that the only individuals influenced by this were those who had viewed the symbols created by the large entity in the basement storage closet. Further examination by Foundation Cognito Hazard specialists and screening technology ascertained that the symbols themselves were a sort of pyroclastic cognito hazard. Any individual becoming aware of the symbols would inevitably succumb to the effects of the hazard, making any additional exploration of the site hazardous. The drone was left unattended for several days thereafter, though it did complete its task of transmitting the terminal contents. The contents of this search can be accessed in Addendum 1730.5.
Attempts to reconnect with the drone were unsuccessful. And drone surveillance of the site from outside of the building showed that all the floors above ground level, in the primary structure, were entirely empty. The drone was not located. Exploration Log 7. Team, Mobile Task Force Z9. Codename, Mole Rats. Assignment, Site 13 continues exploration. Lead, Y24 Arizona. Notes, due to high casualties sustained by previous exploration attempts, it was decided that a team experienced an exploration of anomalous structures would be called in to continue operation at SCP-1730. To that end, MTF-79 Mole Rats was assigned to SCP-1730. The team consisted of five explorative members and one support member who would stay at site command and monitor fluctuations in local reality. We're online. Let us know when you've got a link, support. Coming up now. I'm loading your displays with what should be a pretty accurate map of what you should see in there, but... Don't bet on it, right? Like always. It's fully possible that there's a type green in there, alongside the other nasties. All right, Command. What's the worst of it? There is at least one cognito-hazardous entity riding hazards on the walls. Your displays should be able to filter out any and all messages written on the walls, so we don't take any chances. As for the rest, it's a containment site. Awesome. There you have it, guys. Load up. Let's get in there. Yes, ma'am. Z9 team enters the main structure but search the upper floors first. As observed by the flying drones, the floors are empty. There's no sign of the previous exploration drones. We're clean here. How are we looking, Command? Holding steady, Hollis. Nothing out of the ordinary. Tell Rocky that they need to adjust their channel frequency. I'm having trouble connecting to that module. Will do. Rocky, check your frequency. You're falling out. Roger. The team descends to main level. After ascertaining the functionality of their hazard-blocking displays, the teams move towards the descending stairwell instead of the service elevator. Going down now. Starting to see some of that sludge. Any idea where it comes from? Part of the mixture is power station runoff, but it's mostly blood and some other biological residue, like pus. As for where it comes from, your guess is as good as ours. Yeah. Guess that's what we're here to find out. This stuff doesn't stink like you think it would. Just smells like pennies. Tighten up. We're going into the dark. Team descends several levels until they reach 6th basement level, marked as Euclid Containment Wing. Z9 Hollis motions to enter the floor. Lots of bodies in here, Cap. I see them. Not all human, are they? Nope. They've all got that lip to them, though. From the briefing. Blood on their faces. Stay alert, guys. Team moves forward for a short time, investigating the mostly empty floor. Suddenly, a rumbling is heard. All team members stop and wait for the noise to end. There's a crash, and Z9 Rocky shouts. Ah! So what was that? Came from below you. Notice any structural damage? Sure fucking did. Floor collapsed on the Rocky. It's down below us. I can see him. Rocky, you read me? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Cap, I'm alright. Uh, I'm alright, but my leg is pretty fucked. Uh, I don't know if I can get up. All right, stay there. We're gonna get down to you. Astoria, stay here with Rocky. Forrest, move with me. Let's find a stairwell down. Hollis, something fluctuating below you. You copy? Z9 Hollis does not respond. Site Command also attempts to communicate with Z9 team, but fails to do so. Communications continue to be transmitted from the team. Ugh. Where are they? Should be on their way. Any way you can get down here? Not without breaking my legs. You, you sure? I, I think I can hear something down here. I can't hear anything. It's probably just the pipes. Fucking pipes. From Z9 Rocky's perspective, the floor is shrouded in darkness beyond four meters. The only illumination is coming from the floor above. No, no, it's it's definitely something. It's fuck Astoria. It's it's slithering. There's something down here. Hang on, mate. Hollis, you read me? Hollis? Forrest? Anybody? God damn it. 
Astoria, it's right here. I can hear it. Get, get the fuck away from me, you slimy asshole. I said get the fuck back. Don't shoot anything, Rocky. You'll... Uh... Xenon Astoria's camera observes what appears to be a black, leech-like creature, approximately the length and width of an adult human arm, moving slowly towards Z9 Rocky. Z9 Rocky continues to fire wildly, causing Z9 Astoria to run behind the opening in the floor for cover. Suddenly, the gunfire stops, and Z9 Astoria looks back over the edge. Rocky, Jesus, fuck! I... The creature has now entered Z9 Rocky's open mouth and is moving slowly down his throat. Z9 Rocky's mic picks up muffled cries and a low grinding noise, like a chewing. Z9 Astoria aims their weapon at the creature with fires, missing it when Z9 Rocky twitches. Z9 Astoria fires again, striking Z9 Rocky in the arm. Astoria raises their weapon and fires at Z9 Rocky. There's another rumble, and the ground beneath Z9 Astoria gives way. Z9 Astoria falls onto the concrete below and is crushed by additional falling debris. Z9 Astoria's camera and microphone disconnect. Z9 Rocky's microphone continues to pick up Z9 Rocky's choking and vomiting for an additional five minutes after which Xenon Rocky grows silent. Another leech creature emerges from his mouth and disappears. Xenon Rocky stands and picks up Xenon Astoria's weapon. Xenon Rocky's camera disconnects. Note, at this point, Xenon team was in full disconnect. Two members were assumed KIA, while the other two were not accounted for. After three hours of non-communication, Site Command contacted Overwatch Command to request a full stop to all exploration efforts into SCP-1730. While waiting for a response, Z9 Forest's microphone came back online. Didn't look, did you? Yeah, me neither. Cap? It was over there against that wall. Is it not there anymore? I can get it open. We need fucking bullets. I think they're gone. Yeah. But I don't want to wait around for... Lower. What floor are we on right now, anyway? I thought they were only supposed to be 15. Fuck. Alright. Z9 Rocky's camera suddenly comes online, showing a massive room, dimly lit by many small flames. Further observation of the footage shows that small flames all originate from the ears of several humanoids, standing quietly around the walls. In the center pit is a large creature that appears to be covered in many smaller creatures. It is barely distinguishable in the low lighting. Several large pipes over the creature have been cut and are draining out into the center of the room. The camera cuts out. Note. With the entire team once again unresponsive, Site Command ordered an emergency termination of all exploration efforts into SCP-1730. Four hours pass with no response, before Z9 Hollis's camera begins transmitting. Microphone comes online shortly after. Z9 Hollis is standing in a very tall room, looking at some kind of large and intricate machine. They approach the machine slowly, before settling over some kind of input console with a backlit screen. Z9 Hollis wipes dust off a label just above the screen. The word Thresher is clearly visible. Z9 Hollis's hands hover over the keyboard at the console. Another distant sound can be heard at the microphone, later identified as footsteps. Z9 Hollis turns quickly to face the darkness behind her. As she turns, her shoulder-mounted light strikes something on the machine behind her and goes out. The footsteps grow closer. Z9 Hollis begins to breathe heavily and starts running through the dark. She trips and falls, and the noises begin to close in. Z9 Hollis's camera disconnects. No additional transmissions are received from the Z9 team. Addendum 1730.4. Recovered data from Power Station Terminal. 
Dr. Hadley. As you can see, the power output pressure device has been adjusted to your specifications. At your command, the reactors will surge the full 55 GW required to activate the device. Like I mentioned in our previous correspondence, the reactors will likely not survive this kind of power surge. The core dedicated to the body pit might, given its reinforced construction, but there will likely be significant damage to all the rest. Additionally, and you'll forgive me for speaking out of place since I'm not assigned to the Thresher device, but the device is still wildly unstable. The tests have been encouraging on smaller subjects, and it might someday be an applicable piece of technology, but at this moment it is only considered a measure for very final attempts. Utilization of the device could make the local reality unstable here, as well as wherever the device ends up. In other words, I hope you know what you're doing. Addendum 1730.5. Collected data logs. The following data logs were collected by the mobile access drone sent into SCP-1730. Dear Dr. Hadley, we have received your communication and thank you for taking the time to contact us. We have considered your request, but at this time we cannot approve any transfers. If you are at Site-13, you are there because of your superb level of professionalism and aptitude in your profession, and we cannot afford to have you anywhere else. You may speak to your Site Pharmacist about an amnestic regimen if you like, but we will not allow you to transfer from Site-13. As for your concerns about Director Emerson's mortuary protocol, we understand your complaints. However, you must understand that anomalies, especially those classified as humanoid, are not human beings. Human beings fall into a very specific category of non-anomalous life forms. Humanoid anomalies may appear to be human, but are simply humanoid. As such, they are not entitled to the rights and privileges afforded to human beings by the Ethics Committee. Our job, as researchers, is to identify where anomalies come from, and then to identify how to best utilize those anomalies for the benefit of mankind. We are protectors, and we cannot protect unless we know everything there is to know about the threat at hand. Once we have learned what we can learn, we neutralize the threat. If you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to contact our offices. Sincerely, Peter Grenwald, SCP Foundation Ethics Committee Chair, Global Occult Coalition Ethics Board Head. Test Log, Entity 3421. Administrator, Dr. 1343. Test Purpose, to identify Class 8 Entity's ability to bend reality while exposed to dangerous conditions and to Scranton Malleus Inhibitor Device. Use of SCP-2412 to reanimate Entity between tests. Test 1, exposure to temperature, negative 35 degrees Celsius. Result, entity loses energy, becomes less hostile. Extended exposure results in low external temperature and decay of skin layer. Entity expires after one hour of sustained exposure. Test 2, exposure to temperature, 150 degrees Celsius. Result, entity quickly succumbs to heat stroke. Body shows signs of burning across all surfaces. Organ damage as a result of extreme temperature. Entity unable to change reality to save itself. Test 5. Submerge in water. Result. Data not found. Notes. Water seems to interfere with Scranton Mollius device. Test 13. Exposure to electricity. Result. Entity unable to save itself. Body no longer salvageable. Entity moved to body pit for incineration. Engineer 242. From Engineer 129. Subject. Control of hazardous toxins in reactor core. We're having some trouble controlling the waste back up in the pit. The runoff is supposed to be piped off site, but it keeps getting sucked back up in the air intake into the reactor. The stuff is seriously toxic. I don't want to send any of my guys in there to clean it up. Either we shut off the reactor long enough to go down there and clean it up by hand, or we're going to have a pretty serious issue here in a while. Doctor 720. Summary of events. Entity showed unwillingness to submit to further testing, and as such, was swiftly terminated by way of electrocution. Entity moved to body pit for incineration. 
Noting here that additional orders have come in from Director Emerson requesting a full-scale termination of the entire humanoid wing. Those will be processed at your convenience, and we can begin to empty out those floors. Sincerely, Dr. 720. To Dr. Hadley, from Engineer 242. They took your leech boy down to the pit today. I made sure to alter his termination record accordingly, and made sure that output is still blocked up. I don't know what you've got planned for him, but that pit's pretty noxious now. It's not going to be good. Director Emerson. Before we get started, let me just say that that number thing was always bullshit. If you want to properly dehumanize your researchers, you put them in cubicles. The numbers were a joke from the beginning. If you're reading this, then you're left with a decision. What did you think was going to happen, throwing the bodies of anomalies into that pit? Did you think that their being alive made them anomalous? Hell, being alive is the least anomalous part of our humanity. I thought you might have seen that, but then things have changed. The containment breach was my fault. I won't lie to you. In my research, I had the pleasure of analyzing a young boy. His name was Elijah. He subsisted only on blood and he could siphon it through others with his mouth, right through their skin, like a leech. He had no mental capacity beyond two years, and yet he deserved the same chance to live as the rest of us. He did not choose to be the way he was. And then you decided to have him burn like the rest of them. So I modified his record. The fires of your pit would have incinerated him, just agitated him. And that sludge that's been building up? I'm glad you cared to get it cleaned up. I'm sure you're glad too. It's pretty awful down there. Uh, uh, anyway, your decision. The containment breach was inevitable. And whether it was something that crawled out of the pit that did it, or my hand on a button, makes no difference. You have a choice to make. Either stay your course, and certainly be devoured by the creatures you have been torturing for the last 15 years. Or, activate the Thresher device, and hope it dumps you out in a more hospitable reality than your own. Either way, our world will be rid of you and your filth. And we'll be better for it. This is your death game, Bellion. You made your bed. Now you get to die in it. Sincerely, have P.S. I don't know if you even remember when this picture was taken, but I'm sure you'll recognize your own face. Amazing how much can change in just a few years, isn't it? All because you were chasing a promotion. Incredible. I hope it was worth it. Oh yeah, and if you decide you want to talk this out, I'll be down in the basement with Elijah. I've got a nice warm spot for him to get set up when he arrives. You've made sure that there will be plenty of blood. Addendum 1730.6. Received audio transmission. The following audio transmission was picked up on monitoring equipment on the morning of February 1st, 2016. The transmission both speech and an encrypted signal that followed, has been repeating on a continuous loop since it was first detected. The contents of the transmission are accessible below. Hello, my name is Dr. Scott, and I'm a researcher within the SCP Foundation Site 13 Temporal Studies Division. Myself and my team were abandoned within Site 13 during a recent catastrophic event, the full details of which we do not know. We are currently surrounded by hostile entities and other hazardous anomalies. Of the original 30 members of my team, only 12 remain. To any Foundation operatives listening on this channel, we are asking for assistance. Our supplies are dangerously low, as is our ammunition. Without aid, it is unlikely that we will last more than another month. 
following this message will be an encrypted, adjusted VMS transmission, decipherable by standard 1980s foundation technology. The information within that transmission will contain our location, as well as we can describe it. The transmission is wired by dead man switched to myself, and will be played on a continuous loop until such time that I die. Please, help us. Addendum 1730.7 Updated Exploration Memorandum. In light of recent information gathered by Foundation surveillance teams, it's been deemed pertinent to once again send Exploration and Recovery Teams into Site 13. By order of Overwatch Command, SCP-1730's containment procedures have been updated. Mobile Task Force Tau-5, Simsera, is currently under consideration for deployment. Details to follow. Exploration Log 8 Team Mobile Task Force Apollo 3 Codename Game Wardens Assignment Site 13 Continues Exploration Lead AP3 Ross Radio's live. Everybody good? Hang on. 60 seconds to insertion. Copy. Vigo, you good? Yeah, I got it. We said We're good. All right, stay cool, keep your lights on. If you see anything suspect, hit your visors and give everyone else the heads up. Remember, the internal topography of this place is unstable, so there's a pretty good chance we'll get separated. If we do, stay put until the place stabilizes, and somebody will come pick you up. Use your broadcasters if nobody's responding, and shoot anything that moves. Unless it's one of us. Probably. Then definitely shoot. <laughs> 30 seconds to insertion. Houston, you take lead. Our information suggests this entrance leads down a pretty long staircase, but there shouldn't be any other doors we encounter until we hit the bottom. So we should be more or less safe until we get there. Got it? Got it. Any other questions? Hollow, you're quiet back there. I'm good, boss. All right, that's what I like to hear. Ten seconds to insertion. Here we go. Game wardens, you are clear to begin operation. Let's roll. Team enters SCP-1730. As expected, initial interior space is a long descending staircase. AP-3, Houston, takes lead. Team, we're monitoring you from here, but let us know if you hear, see, or experience anything unexpected. Copy. Team descends for three minutes. Interior of SCP-1730 is unlit, with the only luminescence coming from the shoulder-mounted lights of the team. How are we looking? Pretty good. We... I see a door up here. On the landing. I see it. All right, that's unfortunate. Houston, Vigo, keep an eye on our backs when we pass it. Hang on. Team stops at a landing. AP-3 Houston tries the door, but it is locked. There's air blowing under the door here. See where the dust is kicked up? Yeah, Vigo, let's see that thermal camera. All right, hang on. Here it is. Yeah, no, I don't... <laughs> I'm not even going to get in the fuck with that. Let's keep going. Team lead, you copy? Is everything all right? Uh, yeah, we're good. Still descending. Affirmative. Just got some static. Wanted to make sure you were good. Team descends for two minutes. Light. Look. Yeah, command. There's a light up ahead. Might be our exit. Eyes open. Shit. God damn it. Alright, command, be advised that the bottom of the stairwell is just missing. I don't know where the light we saw is coming from, but we go down about three more steps and we're in some sort of void. I don't see a bottom to it. Copy that. Hang tight, team. We're taking a look at this. What if we drop something in it? See how far down it goes? I mean, I can see how far down it goes, and it sort of looks like forever. Game wardens, go ahead and proceed back up. 
We'll see about another insertion point. Damn it. It's all right. We'll just... Ross, look. It's not a void. It's a liquid. It's just not reflecting light. Like, at all. It's pitch black. Looks sort of like water. Hang on. Yeah, we're not gonna fuck with that either. Command, how far are we to the bottom of this stairwell? One moment. You're about 15 meters below where we expected the stairwell to end. Stellar. The topography is off here. Let's head back up a ways and see if we can find a different exit. Team lead, hold position for a moment. We're trying to determine your location right now. Hey, Chief? Hold on. No, look, it's... Shut up, I'm... Shit. All right, fellas, time to go. Black liquid begins to quickly rise behind MTF AP3. T moves quickly up the stairwell in relative silence. It's gaining on us. Fuck. Come on. Jesus Christ, I... Ross, help me grab Houston. Shit, don't... My legs. Fuck, fuck, fuck. My legs, I... There's another door up here. Hurry. Hang on. Team enters door on the next landing. Door slammed closed. Holy Jesus. What happened to his legs? Shit. Houston, are you... I... Uh... Wait. What? What's happening? Do you read it? Yeah. Sorry, Command. That all happened quickly. Houston fell coming up the stairs, and his legs got covered in that... stuff. And now they're just gone. One clean cut. Like, uh, they weren't there. I can actually still feel them, guys. Like, I can see they're not there, but it doesn't hurt. And I think I can stand up. What the fuck? AP3 Houston proceeds to stand up. They are missing their legs from the knee down, and appear to be floating, as if their legs were still there. AP3 Vigo waves their hand underneath Houston's legs, which passes through the space unimpended. Weird. All right, so there's that. You aren't hurting, Houston? Nothing feels different. Okay, that's fucking crazy. Command, do we know anything about this? Negative. All right, let's keep going then. Command, it looks like we're in a maintenance hallway or something similar. We got pipes running up and down the walls, gauges and such. It's pretty warm here. There, on the wall. What happened to Site 13? His recurring phrase that keeps showing up written on the walls here. Command, do we know that's not a meme? It isn't. None of the studies we ran uncovered any anomalous effects related to that phrase. We're still not sure why we keep finding it, though. Noted. Down this hall. Team continues in silence for four minutes. During this time, AP3 Ohalo's camera disconnects suddenly. This information was not promptly relayed to the task force. There's something up ahead, see? There, at the corner. Is that a person? Approach with caution, safety's off. Team approaches target in silence. Upon reaching target, video feed shows a severely disfigured, rotted human corpse, age unknown, partially conjoined to the wall behind it. Several other spatial distortions are evidently nearby, such as the ceiling and the wall appearing to pull back into each other. But this is unnoticed by AP3. Oh shit! Gonna finally see a familiar face! Guys, it's Zachary! Team lead, please be advised that you are under the effects of a powerful cognito hazard. We are attempting to upload a filter to your scramble visors. One moment. <laughs> nah, command, it's alright. It's just Zachary. We go way back, don't we, buddy? AP3 Vigo playfully punches the corpse, dislodging its jaw. The corpse does not respond. Zachary, we're looking for some other people trapped in here. Do you know how to get to the lower levels? Shit. Okay, okay, so wait. What's below that? Uh huh. Shit, he's right. Where's Ohalo? The team turns. AP3 Ohalo is not seen. Shit, Zachary, stay here. Ohalo, do you read me? Ohalo, it's Ross. Do you hear me at all? Command, where the fuck is Ohalo? That's uncertain, team lead. Be advised, the upload is complete. Please restart your visors for the filter to take effect. There we go. What was it that... Oh, gross. Command, there's a body in the wall down here. Looks like it's been fused into it, or... Something? Our visors are taking like crazy too. Acknowledged, team lead. 
Proceed. Wait, look back there. You see shimmering? Is that gas? Looks like a gas leak. Oh, fuck, no. Look at the floor and look behind it. Fuck, fuck! Shit, oh hollow shit. Approaching MTF AP3 is a shimmering, transparent, humanoid construct, apparently the source of the spatial anomalies in the area. As its feet touch the ground, the floor begins to warp within the space around them, stabilizing after the entity has passed by. AP3 Ohala was seen hanging beyond the entity, though the nature of the agent is uncertain, as the spatial anomaly they are caught in appears to be extremely severe and very few of their features can be made out. Ohalo is seen attempting to move slightly, but continues to be twisted by the anomaly as it moves. Fucking shoot it, goddammit! Open fucking fire, shit! MTF AP3 fires on the entity. As the bullets approach, their trajectory changes and they twist and spin around the entity before falling harmlessly on the floor, or lodging themselves into the ceiling. This isn't working, Chief. We- My fucking arm, shit! AP3 Vigo is seen turning and attempting to pull away from an unseen force. From AP3 Houston's camera, a long, shimmering, transparent appendage is seen stretching towards AP3 Vigo, abstracting the wall closest to it as it moves. It wraps around AP3 Vigo's left arm, which begins to visibly distort. Houston, the anchor. On it. AP3 Houston produces a miniature portable Scranton reality anchor, which they power on and lob towards the entity. There's a flash of red lights, and for a split second, the entity becomes visible as an extremely disfigured, grotesquely elongated humanoid, which exists for only a second, before the spatial distortions surrounding it are anchored and violently reset, creating a massive pressure wave in the confined space. The team is momentarily incapacitated. AP3 Vigo's left arm is bright red but otherwise unscathed. AP3 Houston assesses it. The color will go away. That's just the anchor cooling down. You good? Yeah, I'm all right. Thanks. Jesus. Hollow? Hollow, are you there? Can any of you see Hollow? Ross, here. Look. In the wall. As dust clears, AP3 Ohala becomes visible, partially fused with the wall, ceiling, and floor across 10 meters of hallway. The agent is unmoving. Labyrinths, twists, minotaurs, mad. The lake is clear. Behold a secret. God. Command, dearie me. Hello? We read you, team lead. We've lost a hollow. There in the wall. Do you want us to proceed? One moment. Team lead, do you feel as if returning to the surface will be more dangerous than continuing your mission? I... I have no way of knowing that. We have no way of knowing what's in here. Everything in here is so fucked, it's incredible. I don't even know if we can get back if we wanted to. None of the other teams have, have they? That is correct. (sighs) Honestly, whatever happens down here can't be any worse than whatever we'd see on our way back. Probably doesn't make a difference. Whatever, let's keep going. Affirmative. Team lead, we are preparing another team to evac you in the event that you reach your target. Insertion time is in four hours. You're sending another task force in here? What idiots volunteered for that gig? Samsara. Oh. Alright. Cool, I copy. Team continues on for a short time, unimpeded. They pass through several other areas, including a ransacked infirmary, a cafeteria space melted into slag, and a wing of containment units identified as Olympia class, that are no less than 100 meters in height. Eventually, the team enters a room off of the main hallway that appears to be a telecommunications center. A single television is illuminated on the wall across from them. This is weird. Stay cool, guys. Search this room, see if there's anything we can collect they could use topside. These terminals have power. I'll collect a backup. 
There's a sound on the other end of the room, like static. Vigo and Houston move towards the illuminated television. Is something broadcasting through this? The screen flickers, and an image appears. The interior of a standard containment cell is shown, though it is devoid of any comforts or belongings. A single red light behind the camera is on, poorly illuminating the space. A long figure is seen huddled in the corner. At the mention of its name, the figure in the corner looks towards the camera. What? What do you want? Who is it? Jesus. My name is Carter Ross. I'm an agent with the... Actually, hang on. Who are you? The figure shifts sideways, and more of its body becomes visible through the darkness. The red light illuminates its eyes, though little else of the figure can be made out. You know I can smell you even if I'm here. You don't know that though. They did, but you're not like them. They went to great lengths to figure that out. They knew. They know. They will know. Mm. A teammate said you're Bobble the Clown. Is that right? The figure slides slowly across the wall of the cell, just out of range of the red light. Its movements are noticeably erratic. It comes closer to the camera. They had a number for me once, when I was Bobble. But your friends didn't like the number. Decided to be identified with the number. Hmm. I am not Bobble, but I am a thing that used to be Bobble. You're not where you're supposed to be, gun buddy. You don't match the air in here. You're all out of place, just like I am, just like we are. Uh-huh. What happened here? Dr. Emerson played a tricky little game with the strings of the universe. He walked on them like a tight rope and was surprised when he fell. Tricky little Emerson. Didn't want full boxes, no, no, no. He wanted boxes full of ideas. Ideas like pain, horror, death. He worked very hard to stack those boxes on his string and broke the whole thing. And we all came tumbling down with him. <laughs> How many other entities are in here? What else do you know? How many? How many entities were swallowed by Site 13? <laughs> silly, silly, out of place boy! Silly little boy, everything has made its way into Site 13. If the Foundation could find it and the Coalition could catch it, it was fed into the meat grinder down here. Everything. They mulched us all if there was nothing to gain. Some got lucky. Bobble got lucky. Stuffed in a funny box and experimented with. To see what sounds we made when we wanted to die. Others were not so lucky. They burned the library, you know. Held it upside down like a can of soup and let the contents run out into the furnace and burned the whole place up. They did other things, too. Worse things. Dr. Emerson liked it. He watched it all, every time. What worse things? The unidentified figure approaches the camera and comes fully into view. Illuminated by the red light, a significant portion of its body is distorted by video static that moves as it moves. The static appears to be cutting into the tissue of the figure's body, creating large lacerations that ooze a dark yellow fluid. As it moves, the figure appears to be sloughing off large portions of its mass, which are replaced by static. Half of its face sloughs off as it nears the camera, and one eye becomes shrouded in static. Every worse thing. Chief, we're picking up something on the radio. I think it's a survivor signal. We must be getting close. Alright, let's keep moving. Have fun, boys. Don't let the dead bugs bite. <laughs> If you see Dr. Emerson down there, tell him Bobo the Clown says hi. 
AP3 team passes out of the telecommunication room and into the main hallway. Following the strength of a signal discovered by AP3 Vigo, they near an area that appears to be a cryogenic containment unit, similar to those utilized in the defunct cryogenic Y-wings of Site-19. As they pass through this area, command loses signal of each member of the team, with only intermittent static being broadcast. This continues for 30 minutes before signal is received again. Command, are you there? Do, do you read me? Houston, we read you. Are you alright? Is everyone alright? Oh shit, thank god. We've been trying to read you forever. Yeah, we found the survivors. There are hold up down here and... I don't know what you'd call this place, but it's not conducive to habitation. We're looking at 20, maybe 30 people. We found some other agents of ours too. A few mole rats and a guy from the Travelers. They all ended up down here. Are you prepared to evac? Uh, yeah. So... That's not going to happen the way I think we want it to. Not currently. It's a whole lot worse than we anticipated, Command. I don't know how they ever locked some of this stuff up. But suffice to say that every single containment cell is broken open. And this shit is real. Like, really real. We keep hearing things down the hallways nearby. I think whatever is out there is looking for us. I think they're angry. If they find us, we don't have the bullets to keep them down, let alone get these people out. Where is Ross? He's been trying to get some defenses ready with the others, in case they come tonight. It's not looking good, you know? I don't know if you guys have a backup plan, but we'll take any ideas. How long have you been down there? Uh... Maybe three days? Affirmative. Apollo 3 team, be advised that we are activating and inserting Tau 5 for rescue and recovery. Fuck yes. Tell them to hurry. Recovery Log 1. Team, Mobile Task Force Tau 5. Codename, Samsara. Assignment, Site 13 Personal Recovery. Lead, T5 Arantu. Note. The following is audio video logs of the extraction and recovery mission carried out by the members of Mobile Task Force Tau 5, Zamsera, after contact by MTF AP3 game wardens with human survivors within SCP-1730. The AP3 team had requested assistance in extracting survivors due to the large number of hostile entities within the site. Each member of MTF Tau 5 was outfitted with a number of cybernetic enhancement per the specifications of their design, including arm-mounted incendiary cannons, shock-absorbing leg extensions, heat-resistant plating, built-in scrambled adaptations within the eyes, and others. Tau 5's insertion point was a drainage gate near the secondary entrance that the AP-3 team had inserted through. We're plugged in. Site Command, do you read me? We do. 60 seconds to insertion. So, how dangerous should this mission be considered? Not a single person they've sent in there has come out yet. Acknowledged. This should be engaging. Team, check your optics. The last thing we need is somebody succumbing to a mimetic hazard. Understood. I'm good. Also good. I'm good. Good. Remember, all we're looking to do here is extract the survivors. We're not attempting to contain anything. So if you see something nasty... Put it down. As always. <laughs> I don't need to be convinced. Team, you are 30 seconds to insertion. Ten seconds to insertion. Tau 5, you are cleared to begin extraction and recovery. Let's go. T5 team enters SCP-1730 through a drainage gate under the secondary office structure. Each team member activates their shoulder-mounted lamp, illuminating the tunnel. After a short time, the team reaches another gate. Several large drainage pipes are visible behind the gate. Look. Up against the gate. Bodies. 
These look... very burned. Where do you think they came from? Hard to say. I can't imagine they would have made it far in this condition. There's an incinerator near here, right? Near that body pit we keep hearing about? Maybe they came from there. An incinerator? As good a place to start as any. Let's get into those pipes there. T5 team cuts through the gate and scales the wall behind it to the largest of three drainage pipes. Team continues on foot for a short time. The temperature is rising. I noticed it as well. We must be getting close. We're descending right now, too. This is strange. Shouldn't a drainage pipe run out? Not in? Maybe. Maybe it's affected by the topographical abnormalities. Likely. I run to. The wall is weak here. I can hear echoing on the other side of it. What's over there? Hang on. A hallway, I think? I see. All right. We'll split up here. Monroe, you and Nanku see where this tunnel lets out. Onru and I will go through this wall and see what's on the other side. And if we get killed? Don't get killed. Understood. T5 team splits up, with T5 Nanku and Munru following the drainage pipe towards the source of the heat, and T5 Irantu and Onru going through the thin wall to the hallway beyond. Irantu and Onru manage to break down the concrete wall between the drainage pipe and the hallway beyond. Within the hallway are several bare offices, barely lit by dim overhead lights. The entire area appears to have been abandoned for some time. I ran to an Anru, look for an elevator, or stair access, but find nothing. After a short time, Anru finds a door that opens into a control room. A large glass observation window is obscured by some dark material. Many of the controls in this room have been destroyed. This is the control room for the incinerator. See? It says incinerator 1 over there. And below it, it says body pit access below. I've never heard of a furnace that needed its own control room. What's blocking the window there? Blast shields? No. No. These are bodies. And garbage. Refuse. Congealed and coagulated. Look. You can see faces. I see it. Our intel said that one of the engineers had blocked up the drainage pipes out of here. Nanku and Munru are probably going to run into that. I wonder if there's another way down from here. I thought we'd be able to go down through the incinerator. Hang on. Onru proceeds to look over the controls of the relatively undamaged controller near the observation window. As they do, Nanku and Munru appear at the door. It's blocked. Something has turned the end of that pipe into slag. We tried to punch through it, but it's too damn thick. I broke my hand on it, look. It was broken, I mean. Quiet. Onru is looking for something. Got it. Onru throws a large switch and turns several nearby knobs. There's an immense groaning sound, and the mass in front of the window begins to spin slowly. There is a jolt, as if something has broken free, and the mass begins to spin rapidly and slowly descend. There is the distinct sound of a turbine spooling up. The team's internal temperature gauge begins to register a steady increase in heat. It's dropping. Look down there. See? The mass has cleared the window, revealing a massive cylindrical chamber on either side at least 300 meters in diameter and roughly 400 meters deep. At the center of the chamber is a massive shaft extending the full height of the chamber, attached to several large turbines. As the turbines spin, the matter within the chamber is turned into a slurry. Near the top of the chamber are several pilot lights. Large holes are present around the outside of the chamber. All right, and then... Anru throws another switch, and the pilot lights are ignited. Enormous streaks of fire cascade down from the ceiling of the chamber, scorching the mass below. Additional jets of flame begin to emit from the walls of the chamber. Look, down near the bottom. There's a sluice gate that looks like it's leading away from here. Can you get that door open? Got it. Excellent. Though I still don't know how you think we're going to get in there. The pipe is blocked. Nanku extends their arm, 
and fire several rounds from a wrist-mounted projectile weapon at the glass window in front of them. The glass cracks and shatters, exposing the room around them to the heat of the chamber. Straightforward. One does what one can. The team enters the incinerator and jumps down onto the ledge below. Near another drainage pipe, they can make their way through the vast chamber, avoiding the spinning blades and ever-descending biological slurry around them. Something unpleasant took place here. Oh? Yes. All this has to be draining somewhere. Likely out below us, through one of these fissures. We don't have time to find out. We'll follow this pipe down and see where it goes. Team enters the open door and descends down the drainage pipe a short distance, before it empties into a large cistern. The team enters the cistern, which is lit from above by a large, glowing, plant-like structure. Interesting. What do you think that is? I... I don't know. At the sound of their voices, the glowing structure begins to shake slowly, and thousands of glowing, spinning pods are released from its body. As they fall, they brightly illuminate the entire chamber. Look, the shadows. The glowing pods create vaguely humanoid shadows on the walls of the cistern, which act in an anomalous manner. These shadows appear to reach their hands up or forward, as if towards the team. As the pods reach the slurry below, they extinguish and the shadows disappear. All right. Which way do we go? This is a drainage pipe leading away from the incinerator. The incinerator is underneath the power station, which is to the east of the compound. So far as we can tell, we need to go northwest from there. So, hang on. Look over there. At what? At the wall. Something is seeping through it. Was that there before? No. And it's black and shiny and definitely seeping. Something is pushing through. What does that mean? What is it, drainage? Unlikely. It's probably runoff from the reactor, or- No, it's blood. It's leeches. What? Look. Anru points at a spot on the wall, illuminated by their shoulder-mounted lamps. At that point, a thick flow of black fluid is seeping between a crack in the wall, and something small is wriggling within the crack. The team zooms in on the spot, revealing a small, writhing leech pushing its way through the spot. It breaks through and falls to the ground. Huh. It's a leech. What does that mean? Nothing good. The small leech moves towards the biological slurry at their feet and begins to ingest it. As it does, the leech slowly begins to grow in size. More of them. In the wall. There. Pushing through. The team looks back towards the wall, where several sprouts of black fluid are beginning to pour through various cracks along its surface. Several more small leeches are squirming through these cracks. Onru, what do you see? There's something below us. It's huge, covered in other people's blood, reaching up towards us. These are like fingers. They all communicate back to the host. The... Bring me a leech. What? You're kidding. No, bring me one. They're telepathic, they're communicating that way. I... I need a leech. Irantu moves across the room before grabbing a leech off the ground. As they pull it away from the liquid, it struggles and squirms, biting several large chunks out of their hand. Peculiar. Here. All right, one moment. Andrew extends their hand towards the leech, which opens up to reveal a series of long, delicate, metallic rods with pointed tips. They maneuver the rods into the flesh of the creature, near the base of the brain. There. Let's see. They heard the incinerator activate. They're hungry. They're coming up here to eat. A lot of them. The host is down below us, but I can't see that far down. If I look at the neural activity of the entire network of entities, I I can map out the areas they're in. Let me see if I can do something with that. Um... uh, uh, There. There we go. You should all have it in your retinas now. Clever. So we're looking at a map? It seems too distorted to be a map. Ongoing topographical changes means that, uh, despite the changes in the structure of the site, 
it's all still located within our local reality. It's just unstable. Do we know where this Thresher device is? Probably something to do with this section here. If you follow a logical structural design plan based on the evidence provided in this map, there should be a whole extra wing here. But there aren't any of the leeches down that way. Yes. I can see Conduit running to that area. That... that's where the Thresher machine is. What about our recovery? This area here. Several corridors lead to a large research wing, but most of them have been blocked off. Every now and then, one of the ends of the network goes dark here. The survivors are in there. What's the fastest way in from where we're at now? Three paths to choose from, each with different potential hazards. The first takes us further down this pipeline until we reach a waste treatment facility within the plant. This is the longest route, but from that facility, it's a fairly direct shot towards the survivors. The second path drops us into another cistern below this, which leads directly to this large chamber here. The leech is in there. I can hear it right now. It's wondering why this one hasn't come back. And the third? The third route takes us through this area here, which... I can hear the leeches as they move around the site. They're noisy, uncoordinated, acting on impulse and without much... finesse. But in this area, they're all very quiet. They go in and out for... something, but they do it very, very quietly. Look at this leech. It's the size of a cat already. Are there any other entities in there? I can't tell. The leeches follow a single path in and a single path out. They don't stray from it and they don't look around. Which is the fastest path? The last one is the fastest. We follow this tunnel towards a service door and follow a staircase towards the bottom. Once we're there, there's another hallway off to the left that takes us past that area or through it, maybe? And on the other side is the back entrance to our research wing. All right. That's the one we'll take then. A shame. Here I thought we'd be shooting leeches. You'll have plenty of chances to on our way out, I'm sure. We need to get those people out quickly. Onru, does it feel to you like the leeches are trying to get into the wing where the survivors are? Yes. There's plenty of blood in this site, but not all of it is still warm. They'll be coming for them soon. Team leaves Cistern and follows Drainage Pipe West. Eventually, the team reaches a service door lit by a single flickering lamp. There's something written on this door. Blood. Here on the wall, too. Look. What's it written in? Wait. Look. Anru amplifies their shoulder-mounted spotlight, illuminating the entire wall of the tunnel. The word blood is repeated over and over, scrawled across the surface of the wall in a thick black substance. Anru turns left, illuminating several desiccated corpses in a corner at the end of the tunnel, all of which are covered and seeping the same fluid. Unsettling. Come on, don't waste time. The team enters the service door, revealing a partial staircase. The stairs above them are intact, but the stairs below have been destroyed. The walls of the stairwell are coated in cracks, through which seeps the black fluid. Munru lights a flare and drops it. The team watches it fall. After a short time, the flare lands with a slight splash, revealing the floor below. How large is this site? Site 19 has at least 50 underground floors and no fewer than 80 individual wings. Considering what we know about Site 13, it's likely that there are at least twice as many of each, if not more. The Euclid-class containment cells alone are as large as the entirety of Site 81. Which means there could be worse things down there that nobody has seen yet. It's almost a certainty. Irantu leaps from the landing and lands near the flare, their implants absorbing the majority of the impact. The rest of the team follows suit. At the bottom of the stairwell is another door into a hallway, and the team enters it. Where to now? About 200 meters down this hallway on the right. There are several security doors, but I think they've all been disabled. Through there is, um, I think it's a data storage center. It's big and lined with vents that lead to the cooling towers at the surface. Where do the leeches start acting strange? In there. Wonderful. T moves down the hallway. As they pass, they check each door to see if they are locked. Most doors lead to network maintenance areas, though notably one door leads to the telecommunication room previously visited by AP3 team. 
One screen on the far wall appears to have been busted from the inside out. Look here. This is the door to the server area. What's that door there? It's marked as stairs to cryonics. If I had to guess, I'd say it probably goes up to the next levels. And it's seated right on top of this room. Acts as an insulation for the data center. Can we go through it? Which way's faster, Anru? The only way I can see is through the server room. There weren't any leeches up there. That is... very strange. There are certainly plenty of access points to that room. Very strange. Through the server room, then. Come on. The team enters through the door of the server room. They pass through several more security doors, all of which are unlocked. As they do so, the external temperature drops severely, and stays steady at roughly negative 20 degrees Celsius. I ran two motions for the team to activate their internal heating coils, protecting their internal organs from damage due to exposure. As the team proceeds down the hallway into the server room, T5 Nanku Scramble optical implant begins to activate, signaling that an anomalous memetic is being filtered out. However, T5 Nanku had previously disabled the visual cue for the warning on their optical overlay instead relying on the audio cue that accompanied the implant. The audio warning does not trigger at all. It is not until the team enters the primary server room that T5 Anru realizes that no sound is audible at all. Regardless of the source, thinking at first that it might be their auditory implant, Anru removes the implant and restarts it. But after establishing that it is functioning properly, they attempt to communicate this with Irantu. Irantu motions for the team to hold and attempts to discern the source of the anomalous influence. As they do, every other team member receives the warning that their scramble filters are being triggered. Munru motions towards the door they entered through, but Irantu motions towards the back of the server area, towards the research wing. It is during this silent discussion that Nanku first notices movement across the large room. Motioning for their teammates to stay still, each team member begins to hear a quiet whining noise, which slowly grows in intensity. As they huddle up, Munru notices riding on one of the server racks, written in black fluid, that says, Silence, and then, Don't look. They motion towards the rack, and the team acknowledges it. I ran to motions for the team to move towards the far wall, as they slowly proceed between the server racks towards the back exit. Suddenly, Anru catches a momentary glimpse of a large entity across the room, and stops their teammates from advancing. They look around the corner and see the entity again as it comes back into view. The entity is a massive, multi-limbed figure. The primary structure of the entity is a floating, cross-legged humanoid construct with six legs, 18 arms, and 36 forearms attached to 72 hands. Each limb moves independently, gesturing and posing in constant, sudden, jerking movements. The entity does not have a head but instead has a large, flat, circular structure attached to its upper chest that is covered in a large number of symbols and glyphs, which glow with bright white light against the entity's dark, gray-brown skin. On each of the entity's arms are a gold band attached to a chain, which drags against the ground when not being pulled around by one of the entity's gestures. The gold bands are etched with glyphs later identified as being powerful anti kinedo hazards, although the chains are broken and the anti kinedo hazards are inactive. Most notably, a single, severely emaciated, severely charred human figure is bound to the flat circular structure of the entity's head. This figure twists against its restraints and appears to be screaming, likely the whining sound heard through the entity's muting kinedo hazard. As the entity performs its gestures, the glyphs on its hand illuminate rapidly often causing burns where the human skin comes into contact with them, creating further distress and increasing the volume of the whining. T5 Anru also notices that the same aspect of the entity is creating a severe malfunction in their optical implants, singeing the circles responsible for handling the scramble calculations. Anru looks away, ejecting the implants before they damage their retinas, and motion to the rest of Tau 5 team to not look at the entity directly. The team acknowledges, and they continue to move forward, Suddenly, the whining becomes dramatically louder and begins to draw closer towards the team. Munru drops a proximity mine from his pack, and then another a short distance away. As they flee away from the entity, 
streaks of blue electricity begin to arc between the server rack, and the ground beneath them begins to shift, as if it was made of sand. As Nanku threatens to fall into the ground, there is a muffled wave of pressure behind them as the first proximity mine detonates, and the ground solidifies. The team turns a corner, and the back entrance of the room comes into view. Above them, they can see a hole in the ceiling exposing the cryogenics laboratory, and briefly, a complicated containment cell is visible. Though it is thoroughly destroyed, the team moves swiftly towards the door, as white-hot glyphs begin to appear on the ground beneath them, and in the air around them. The team manages to duck and weave through the symbols, but T5 Nanku catches their left arm on a glyph in the air, and it bursts into flames. Irantu, having seen this from their position behind Nanku, fires their weapon at Nanku's shoulder, removing the arm. It falls to the ground and explodes into a cinder. Munru reaches the door first and throws it open, and Anru follows immediately afterwards. Nanku stumbles through, collapsing on the other side, and Irantu comes up last. Just before closing the door, Irantu turns to look at the entity closing in behind them, which at this point was barely visible in a blur of gestures, fiery glyphs, and an inhuman whine. As the door swings closed, Irantu zooms in on the humanoid figure strapped to the entity's head, enough to see the word Emerson seared into the flesh of the figure, as if from a melted patch of fabric. Irantu slams the door closed and immediately ejects their optical implants. The team rushes down the corridor away from the security door, and slowly, the sound of footsteps can be heard around them. They reach a large open space in between several hallways, and stop to catch their breath. I... I don't believe I know how to respond to whatever that was. What was that? I have no idea. I've never seen anything like it. There was a human strapped to its head. Did you see that? I did. I think it was shouting. I'll likely miss that arm later. You'll be alright. Just be careful. Like I needed it anyway. I've got another. Besides... Nanku swings their shoulder-mounted flamethrower to their left shoulder, and detaches it so it hangs below where their missing arm should be. What was I really gonna use that arm for anyway? Noted. Everybody alright? No worse for wear. I'm fine. I'm alright, too. We're here. The team turns to the hallway to their immediate east, which has been barricaded and filled with a substantial amount of explosives and incendiary equipment. Good. Hello? This is Tau 5 Arantu. Is anyone there? We're here to get you out. Hello? Maybe we're too late. We're not too late. Hello? Is anyone out there? Can you? A face can be seen in the space between the crate and the wall. <laughs> Captain. New connection to local transmission network. Zeta 9 Mole Rats, Captain Hollis. Oh boy. The goddamn Power Rangers. They told me about you. You look like you've been hit by a train. Something like that. Well, come on then. We don't have much time left. T moves towards the opening in the crates. As Munru and Nanku pass through, Anru pauses. Irantu notices this and turns to look. Irantu, look. Bitches. Black cracks had begun to form on the walls of the atrium behind them, and wriggling black leeches start to fall out of them, accompanied by a thick, viscous fluid. Uh. Recovery Log 2. Recovery Team. Codename Simsera. Exploration Teams. Codename Game Wardens and Mole Rats. Assignment Personnel Recovery. Leads T5 Aranu, Z9 Hollis, and AP3 Ross. Note The following is an audio log of the extraction and recovery mission carried out by the members of Mobile Task Force Tau 5, Simsera. After having made contact with surviving members of MTF Apollo 3 and MTF Zeta 9, aside from the members of the mobile task forces, the team was tasked with recovering 27 surviving members of Site 13 staff, including Dr. Muhammad Scott, a Site 13 Assistant Director of Temporal Studies. Several of these individuals had sustained significant injuries, further increasing the difficulty of extraction efforts. 
Members of Mobile Task Force Alpha 20, Holy Divers, were stationed above ground and were prepared to move in to aid in extraction efforts once the recovery team had escaped the lower levels of the site. Mike's on. Are we really worried about recording all of this? Hey, Vigo. Shut the fuck up. Do what he says. Your lead, Power Ranger. Thank you. Anru has prepared an evacuation plan. I will let her explain it. Our travel paths from this position are compromised by the entity in the data center and the creature in the atrium. After speaking with Dr. Scott and his team, we have devised a route that leads us as far away from the current major threats as possible. Unfortunately, our information on all threats is incomplete. Even Dr. Scott was not privy to information on all containment entities within the site. As such, we should still proceed with extreme caution. This is likely already well understood. Yeah, just a bit. All right, so what's the route we're taking? Our entry routes are here and here. The largest obstacles we are experiencing currently are the spatial instabilities within the lower levels of the site. On the suggestion of Dr. Scott and Captain Hollis, our route will first travel to this section of the facility where the Thresher device is contained. This device is the cause of the... instabilities. And while it is not possible to completely disable the device without risking our own lives or the lives of above-ground personnel, we should be able to reduce power to the device long enough for us to create a stable path to the surface, following this route here. I got lost once shortly after our insertion and ended up in that room. I was attacked by a number of creatures that were difficult to perceive, likely due to some latent anti-memetic effects. I was able to escape them, but they're no doubt still there. That machine draws a frankly impossible amount of energy from some energy source elsewhere in the site, and those creatures I saw feed off of it. So, there's that. Why don't we send a team ahead to disable the machine, then meet up with them before heading up? We will not have enough time, and the probability of our success drops dramatically if we split up our team. Once the device is powered down, it is likely that we will have less than an hour to make our escape before it trips its failsafes and powers back up again. We will just have to make our push from there, hoping that it buys us enough time. Alright, cool. Your assignments are as follows. Tau 5 will take point. Apollo 3 will take the right and left flanks. And Zeta 9 will take up the rear. The healthiest survivors will stay near the back, and those with more serious injuries will be near the front near Tau 5. In the event that we are flanked or assaulted, follow typical multi-force defensive assignments while allowing Tau 5 to intercept the higher threats. Maintain clear lines of communication. Tau 5 and the task force captains have channel priority. Keep all chatter to the minimum. You will all have plenty of time to speak once we reach the surface. Our priority now is extracting these people and staying alive. Unless you're in samsara, in which case I guess you guys are free to do what you want, but for the rest of us mortals, it doesn't help us to let the Power Rangers get mulched, since we're likely shit out of luck if they go belly up. Agreed. Does everyone understand our mission? Agreed. We're in. Acceptable. I will take point. We need to move quickly. Gather your things, prepare the civilians, and we will leave shortly. Teams break to assemble in their formation. Civilian survivors are briefed on the mission plan and positioned in the middle of the block. Shit. Irantu, we need to roll. Agreed. Let's move out. Munru, Nanku, collapse the main door. We will exit expediently out the side. Gladly. The block moves out of a side door towards a side hallway. T5 Nanku and Munru hang back and set explosive charges around the doorframe. Leeches are beginning to work their way under the doorframe and through the cracks in the walls. As they step away from the door, Nanku opens their flamethrower on the leeches. I cannot say that you're making a difference, Nanku. There's likely many more leeches elsewhere. This is very satisfying to me. Munru and Nanku move quickly to join the rest of the group, which has begun moving down the side hallway. As they pass through the first door, there's an explosion, and the building around them shakes. From beneath the group, a loud, uncanny screaming sound is heard. You think they know we're moving? Undoubtedly. My optics are pinging. Strange. Move everyone back. I'll scout ahead. 
T5 Munro comes around the corner of the hallway, weapon drawn. Their scramble optical implant highlights a dangerous meme on the wall. At the far end of the hallway, a vaguely humanoid entity, the same as seen during the previous remote drone exploration of SCP-1730, is seen drawing on the wall with a long, curved finger. Munro projects an image of the entity to Nanku, who rounds the corner behind Munro. Hold. Suddenly, the entity turns towards Munro and Nanku, and opens a single wide eye, which is immediately processed and blocked by scramble units. The entity begins to move very quickly down the hallway, changing dramatically as it moves. The entity becomes considerably larger, and its long rope flares out to either side, exposing additional hazards that are blocked by the scramble units. Munro and Nanku raise their weapons and fire. The creature reels backwards as it is struck by bullets, with large holes opening across its flesh. Munro reloads, and loads incendiary rounds and fires. As it staggers backwards, the entity begins to scratch madly against the wall to the right, seemingly attempting to dig through the wall, away from the gunfire. Nanku takes one more shot, striking the entity in its eye, and causing it to collapse on the ground. Is everything alright? It appears so weak. Suddenly, the hallway shakes violently. The floor beneath the collapsed humanoid entity crumbles and falls away revealing a large hole beneath the floor. Within the hole is a long, slick, black creature, covered in blood-red eyes, with a mouth full of many rows of long, sharp teeth. As it bursts through the floor, a cascade of small leeches are propelled into the hallway. The humanoid entity slips through the destroyed floor and falls into the mouth of the large creature, which lets out a large scream as it devours the entity. Long, wet appendages snake into the hallway, as Nanku and Munru begin to retreat. Nanku ignites their flamethrower again, warding off the approaching smaller leeches. What's going on? We will need to find a different route, quickly. Follow me. The group moves past the collapsed hallway as Munru and Nanku provide cover fire. They pass through a custodial dormitory and exit into a maintenance area behind it. Over there. We can take this path towards the machine. We're right behind you. But I'm beginning to think this creature is far larger than we anticipated. Onru, take the point. We will move now. T moves down the long maintenance hallway. The hallway curves to the left, opening into a larger space, full of loading equipment and machines. Several large loading docks are visible in the back of the room, although each one is collapsed and destroyed. Irantu, the walls in here are seeping. We can't stay here long. One moment. Onru. Nanku, how far back are you? Munru, Nanku, please report. I ran to. Nanku is damaged. We are not able to rendezvous with you immediately. Onru, do keep us updated on your position, and I will let you know when we can regroup. Understood. The group moves to the far end of the maintenance warehouse, exiting through a pair of doors leading into a staff break room. Black fluid seeps through the walls. The group has to stop briefly to bandage up the survivor, whose wound had begun bleeding again. A loud screeching sound is heard nearby, and the group begins moving again. They enter into another hallway, leading in the direction of the Thresher Wing. As they move through the hole, Anru hears a distant sound. Irantu, wings. How many? Many. More than I can count, they are... Very small, but there's a great multitude of them. You got anything else useful, Power Girl? A tinkling sound. Like crystal on crystal. Fuck. Crystal butterflies. It has to be that. We'll get shredded. Unlikely. The group moves towards the sound, which continues to grow louder until it becomes a cacophonous sound that seems to be right above them. God, where's that coming from? Steady now. Steady. I round you the vent. In front of them. A grate on the ceiling vent falls to the floor, and a cloud of sparkling crystal butterflies begin to fill the hallway. Irantu sees the butterflies and turns back to the group. Everybody down, please. As the group drops to the ground, Irantu runs towards the cloud of butterflies. They disappear briefly, and after a short moment, there's a burst of flames that arcs upwards into the vent, and the sound of shattering crystal can be heard above them. As the smoke clears, Irantu becomes visible again. The majority of their flesh has been shredded by the wings of the butterflies. 
and Irene's whose entire body is scorched. Significant amounts of flesh hang loose from their body. The skin on their back is blackened and blistered, and a thick metal implement is now visible through the scorched flesh. Anru stands and approaches them. Are you able to continue? Of course. Jesus fucking Christ, man. Are you alright? Yes. Why wouldn't I be? The group moves through another hall, seeping with black fluid, and then another. But the third hallway is clean, and relatively untouched. They ascend a short staircase before coming to a stop for a thick vault door. The machine is behind this door. I came out this way, but the door's sealed behind me. I don't know how to unlock it. Dr. Scott, do you know how to open this door? No. I never had access to this chamber. I was hoping Munru would be here. I do not think I can open this door. Suddenly, there is a resounding click, and the door in front of them slowly opens. A monitor next to the door illuminates, and a dark room is visible on it. In the back of the room, hidden in shadows, an indistinct humanoid entity waves. A harsh, electronic static sound, vaguely reminiscent of laughter, can be heard through an unseen loudspeaker. The screen powers off. It's a pretty fucked up clown. Come, hurry. The group enters the chamber beyond. The room is very dark, with a multitude of dim, green lights visible on the walls of the room. Based on the luminescence of the lights, and the apparent distance of them from each other, the room appears to be several hundred meters in diameter. Near the back of the room, a tower of circling green lights is visible. Hey Power Rangers, can you see anything in here? You have dark vision or something, yeah? My visor is shot. Anru and I were forced to eject our implants after they were damaged by a powerful mimetic entity. My visor works. Hang on. Alright, so there's, uh, some kind of machine near the back of the room under those lights. I can't really make out any of it from here, but it's there. I don't sell oh shit. Yeah, I do. On the ceiling, there are... Fuck. There are a lot of those things. What are they? I honestly don't know. I can't make them out. They're definitely fucking with perception. I don't... I don't think they've seen us. Seriously, though, there might be 500 of those things. That would be more than Anru and myself can deal with. We need to make a decision. Either attempt to disable the machine without attracting their attention, or find a way to dispatch the creatures. I am, of course, willing to accept ideas. I mean, we could blow them up. Houston has explosives. Let's allow them to try and get all at once, though. Maybe, but it's more likely that- Suddenly, there is a massive disturbance beneath the chamber. To the left of the group, roughly 100 meters away, there is an explosion and the wall falls away. From within the wall emerges a long, slick appendage covered in red eyes. The eyes all open at once. Fuck. There is a screeching sound, and from above them, many hundreds of short, imperceptible entities fall from the ceiling. The entity in the wall begins to lash out at the smaller entities, attempting to pull them in towards a mouth that has appeared on its front. The creatures fly towards the larger creature and begin to tear at it with their claws, though many of them are shoveled into the open mouth of the creature. It works as well. Onru, get to the machine. The rest of you, get back to the hallway. We will not have much time. The group retreats into the hallway outside of the large room. Anru sprints across the chamber as more and more of the smaller entities fall from the ceiling and attack the large creature. Several of them begin to move towards Anru, only to be dispatched by weapon fire from Irantu. As Anru reaches the manual control panels of the machine, they input the information provided to them by members of Dr. Scott's team. Lights around the room illuminate, exposing an enormous, vastly complicated machine that encompasses the entire back wall of the room. More and more of the hostile entities peel off towards Anru, who pauses to open fire on those who've come too close. From beneath the room, there's another disturbance, and the floor in the middle of the room falls away. Another large entity emerges from a hole in the floor, and long tendrils snake out towards Anru. From behind, I ran to comes gunfire, as the entire AP-3 team has emerged from the door and begun firing at the entity. 
The creature recoils, viscous fluid spilling from the gunshot wounds. The tendrils whip around them, gripping AP-3 Vigo and tossing them into the air. Vigo strikes the wall and their body falls to the ground, where the first large entity grabs it with a tendril and pulls it into their mouth. Suddenly, small leeches begin to pour from the hole in the floor and move quickly towards Irantu and Houston, who open fire on the leeches as Ross moves to pull Irantu away from the hole. As they do, Ross tosses an incendiary grenade into the hole and pulls Irantu to the ground. There is an explosion and flame erupts around the large entity which rears back and flails before collapsing into the hole. From deep below them, the group can hear a very loud screaming sound, and suddenly, the entire room begins shaking. The other large entity retracts into its hole, collapsing the wall behind it as it does. The remaining small creatures from the ceiling are dispatched by AP-3 and Z-9 teams. As they do, the room begins to shake more violently. Several lights affixed to the machine in the back begin to flash and then dim. Fuck! God damn it, Vigo! Fuck! The loss of Vigo is disappointing. I'm sorry. We do not have a substantial amount of time to grieve. We must keep moving. Anru, Ross, Houston, and Irantu leave the chamber. More rumbling is felt beneath them, and occasional loud screeches punctuate the machine noise from this section of the facility. They reach the stairwell and Houston throws the doors open. Whoa, fuck. What? What is the matter? There's nothing here. The door just opens up into nothing. It's just dark, as far down as I can see. It is likely that disabling the Thresher device has altered our previous escape route. We will need to devise another path to the surface. Yes. One moment. Monroe, where are you? Difficult to say, unfortunately. Have you powered down the machine? We just did. Fine timing then. We were being pursued by a creature. Then suddenly there was a wall where the creature had been. The local topography appears to have reset itself. Stay in one place. We will come to find you. Our escape begins now. Fantastic. The main group leaves the empty stairwell and turns back down towards the hallway they came from. Passing by the Thresher Access hallway again, they turn and begin to climb another staircase. As they reach the top, Irantu pauses. The hallway in front of them is flooded by ankle-high water. As they begin to move slowly through the water, one of the researchers behind them screams. What is it? Bodies. Look. Just below the surface of the water, pale human corpses are visible, appearing to be floating roughly half a meter down. Do not attempt to look at them. You do not recognize them. Move quickly. Come on. The team hurries down the hallway, towards another set of doors. Where, written on the walls, are the words, What Happened to Site 13, with the word what covered out by the word Emerson, and the words, Have We Become Blasphemous, beneath that. The group proceeds without incident for a short while longer, slowly ascending as safe routes become available. After roughly eight minutes of travel, the group enters a large mechanical garage, where several pieces of large machinery sit in various states of repair. They pause to secure one of the injured survivors, while Anru attempts to devise a new route. Suddenly, a loud banging sound is heard, and a piece of machinery flies across the room, narrowly missing AP-3 Ross. Whoa, fuck, where'd that come from? In the corner of the room, a stack of mechanical parts is seen moving, rising up and self-assembling into a quasi-humanoid entity. Attached to the top of the large mechanical construct is a small, crudely constructed toy robot. The entity begins to move towards them, and a voice is heard from an unknown source within the entity. <laughs> I am reborn to bring devastation upon this fettered earth. Pitiful humans, you will feel the dark sting of my eternal torment. The small robot on top of the construct is seen waving its arms wildly. This is... annoying. Anru, get these people out. Ross, to me. I am the herald of your destruction. Embrace death. Irantu, Ross, and Houston open fire on the entity, to little effect. The entity lifts another large piece of equipment and throws it towards the group. 
missing them by a wide margin. Houston throws a frag grenade at the entity, which it catches in one of its outstretched hands and grips tightly. How dare you! I will tread upon you like- The grenade explodes, shattering the creature's hand and causing it to stagger sideways. Anru is seen sprinting towards the entity. As they approach it, Anru leaps into the air, sailing over the top of the entity in a tall arc. At the top of the arc, Anru reaches out a hand and grabs a small toy robot from on top of the construct, causing it to collapse. As Anru flips towards the ground, they toss the robot towards the wall. No! I am the Harbinger! I am... The toy robot strikes the wall and shatters. Rantu, is that you? We just heard something crashing. You must be near. Stay where you are. We are en route. The group moves out of the garage and towards a large atrium section. From around the corner comes Munru and Nanku. Munru appears to have sustained burns all over their lower body, but is otherwise undamaged. Nanku is missing the lower half of their jaw, and black fluid covers the front of their bodysuit. Nanku waves with their remaining hand as the group approaches. You look well. <laughs> well, admittedly, morale has increased in the group since Nanku found herself unable to talk. This is a cute reunion, but let's get back to this shit. How far are we from the entrance? This is a main atrium. If we follow this hallway here, it will lead towards a processing station. And past that, we should find access points to the surface. Exceptional. Let's get the lead out then, and- From below them, a very loud crashing sound is heard, alongside more screaming. The floor beneath the group again begins to buckle. Fuck, run! The group flees towards the hallway Munro had identified, but are stopped when the floor there also collapses. A plume of smoke erupts from the destroyed floor, and one researcher slips on the collapsing ground and slides into it. Anru leads the group away from the atrium, as the floor there has completely collapsed. Irantu stops to turn, and looks down inside the hole. Beneath the hole is an incredibly large chamber, appearing to have been dug through dozens of layers of subterranean floors. Within the chamber, there are many small lights around the outside, and at the bottom is a giant, massive, writhering mass, with several other large black masses extending out from it. As they're pulled away, Irantu sees red eyes opening across the entire mass of the creature, and hears more screaming. The group flees down the side hallway, but are pursued by long tendrils, snaking out of the hole. AP3 Ross and Houston open fire on the tendrils, halting them momentarily, but they are quickly replaced by more. Z9 Astoria is seen slipping on a patch of viscous fluid and falling, before being consumed by one of the ends of the tendrils. There are sounds of metal crushing and rock and concrete being grinded, as the structure around the group begins to heave violently. Smaller leeches begin to pour out of the walls around them, and Nanku fires their flamethrower at them. The group rounds a corner and finds a dead end, and turning back are confronted with another tendril that has burst through a hole in the wall. This is it, holy fuck. Onru, we need a way out. I... I'm having difficulty. I... Wait, wait, I have an idea. I think I know where we are. The group follows Hollis towards a descending stairwell and moves quickly down it. Hollis tosses an incendiary grenade towards the encroaching tendrils and slams the door shut behind them as it explodes. The screams from below intensify as they descend and the stairwell begins to shake. Holes in the stairwell open up as more leeches begin to pour out of them. All task force members open fire as long tendrils snake through the holes as well. Upon reaching the landing, Hollis motions the group into a doorway. Here! In here! Go, go, go! The group enters the hallway and sprints towards the other end. As they do, they pass a sign on the wall that reads, Stairs to Cryogenics. Captain Hollis, what are you doing? You're gonna have to trust me here, Blue Ranger. I've been doing this a long time. I... (laughs) <laughs> okay, I think this will work. The group exits the hallway into a large observation section, passing many large windows with blast protectors drawn across them. The team stops in front of one window, overlooking a massive chamber lined with huge steel doors. Overhead are the words, Olympia Class Testing Observation. Hollis, what do you have in mind? Call it a hunch. We need to get downstairs. Come on. The group runs towards the stairwell at the end of the room and quickly descends to the main level of this wing. As they exit onto the floor of the Olympia-class containment chamber, a wall behind them begins to buckle, and leeches pour out of it. Pink Ranger, that panel over there. You need to get that door open. 
What? I said open the goddamn door! Hurry! What the fuck are you waiting for? Go! T5 Anru runs towards the control panel, near one of the tall steel doors. The wall behind them continues to buckle. Monroe, that one. Get that one open too. Yes, absolutely. T5 Monroe attempts to access the door controls, while Z9 Hollis turns towards the group. Everyone else, listen to me. You civilians need to get to the far end of this room, as far as it goes. Just keep running. There's an access point to the power station above this part of the facility. You need to just keep climbing until you get there. Once you're there, you need to blow a wall. That'll get you out. But you need to hurry. Shit is about to pop off in a pretty major way down here. Ross, you and your boys just fire at anything that comes out of that wall. I'll tell you when we can go. Irantu, you stay with me. This is gonna get pretty messy. Understood. All right. Fucking go! Come on! The group flees down the main pathway towards the chamber, away from the buckling wall. As they do, the wall finally gives way, and a gargantuan, slick, black entity pours into the chamber. It is approximated to be at least 200 meters in height, covered with black tendrils and dark red eyes. When the creature sees the group, it opens its massive mouth, revealing rows of long, yellow teeth. In the center of the mouth, a naked human woman is visibly conjoined, in some way, to the prehensile tongue within the creature. As it opens its mouth, it lets out a piercing scream and begins to move towards the group. Every available task force member opens fire on the creature, emptying their remaining magazines and throwing every possible incendiary device towards it. The creature is slightly deterred, but for every place that is pierced by weapons fire, viscous fluid and leeches begin to pour from its body. Several long tendrils begin to snake towards the group. I have it. I have it, Captain Hollis. Come on then, girl. Throw the fucking thing. Anru steps away from the control panel and runs towards the group in the middle of the chamber. As a loud groaning is heard behind them, the rest of the team sees the huge metal doors begin to slide open. A thick cloud of ice-cold fog rolls out of the chamber, obscuring the interior from view. What's in there? Monroe, you got yours? Hang on. Yeah. I think that'll do. Suddenly, the door behind Munru begins to glow brightly red, then white, and then the center of it buckles and the door collapses. As Munru hurries away, a colossal, motionless, flaming humanoid entity floats out of the chamber. In its unmoving hands are a huge sword. As it exits the collapsed doorway, enormous flaming wings unfurl from its back. The large creature begins to scream, and its tendrils begin to lash out at this creature. As the tendrils come close, long streets of fire erupt from the sword towards them, rupturing them and sending viscous fluid and scorched leeches flying across the room. The massive creature screams, and a dozen of other tendrils fly towards the flaming humanoid. As the two engage, there's another sound, like a long whining, and then suddenly, the room is silent. From within the cold, foggy room, a towering, Vaguely servine creature steps out into the main chamber. It is composed of a body covered in light green and cream-colored hair, a long, thin neck ending in a hairless, somewhat humanoid face, and vast intertwined, white and black antlers that pulse with streaks of blue light. Floating above its head are nine concentric rings of glowing, rotating crystals and metallic spheres. The creature slowly steps out of the containment cell and begins to look towards the team on the ground below. It opens its mouth with a long, droning sound. Around its body, several large metallic cylindrical structures appear, followed by a distinct cracking sound. It begins to step towards the team of task force members, but is struck from behind by three tendrils that wrap around its neck. The creature lets out another drone, and suddenly, The sound returns from the chamber as long streaks of fire arc across the space. The cylindrical construct turns lengthwise and speeds across the room towards the large black leech, striking it in the central mass. From all around the servine entity, more and more metallic spheres appear and fly towards both the leech and the flaming humanoid, which in turn begin to attack one another. Fucking yes! Go get him, big guy! Time to fucking go, kids! Let's go! The team begins to sprint after the group of civilians towards the far wall, as jets of flame strike the ground around them. Nanku catches the end of a dismembered black tendril in their shoulder, throwing them off balance. Nanku falls to the ground, firing openly with her weapon as they're engulfed in fire. 
AP3 Houston pauses briefly to turn towards them, but is grabbed by Arantu. We do not have time. As the soldiers near the group of survivors, all of whom who have huddled near an exit door at the end of the chamber, there is a crashing sound, and they turn to see the Servine entity standing up from where it had been thrown across the room. The leech creature whips at it, as more metallic spheres appear and arc back towards it. There is an eruption of fire as the flaming humanoid is struck by another several tendrils, which try to pull the humanoid towards the mouth of the leech creature. The team reaches the survivors and quickly exits through the door. The group begins to quickly ascend the staircase within. All right, just like I said, up. We need to go up, over. A long, thin metallic cylinder crashes through the wall of the stairwell, narrowly missing one of the researchers and Dr. Scott. A second cylinder comes through the wall, striking Arantu and obliterating them as it contacts the wall behind them. As the group continues to ascend, fire fills the stairwell below them, and another long, loud droning sound can be heard, followed by silence, and then followed by a thick bursting sound that shakes the entire facility. The group reaches a landing and begins to move towards another staircase at the end of the hallway. Z9 Hollis hangs behind. What are you doing? Giving you some more time, and something else, I think. Get these people out of here, go! I can stay behind, Hollis. Your life is finite. Yeah, yeah, I get the spiel, Power Ranger, but right now you need to get these people out of here. Let me go do my thing, all right? I'll catch up with you later. I understand. Good looking out, Hollis. (laughs) You almost sounded like a person there for a second, Monroe. Hollis runs away from the group. Monroe catches up to the rest of the group, who reach another staircase and begin to ascend. For the next ten minutes, the group continues to ascend through the facility, several times narrowly avoiding debris and falling rubble as the lower levels of the site begin to collapse. The sound of the entities below continue to be heard, and several times the creatures become visible through large gaps in the walls or floor. At one point, AP3 Ross catches sight of the unmoving flaming humanoid nearly completely covered in metal, as long streaks of fire burst through the open scenes of the encasement. Shortly afterwards, there's a two-minute break in all video footage, followed by a shot of the head of the Servine creature smashing through a wall in front of the group. As they turn to run away from it, the head turns towards them, and two researchers are instantly transmuted into hexagonal columns of an unknown yellow-green material. After a short time, AP3 Ross picks up a signal from Site Command. Team lead, this is Site Command. Do you read us? Holy fuck, yes. Yeah, I do. Do you hear me? We do. You have appeared on our geolocating systems, Ross. You're not far from the exit. Where is Captain Hollis and Irantu? Irantu is dead. Hollis... She ran off a while back. We haven't seen her since then. Understood. What about the rest? We've suffered some casualties, so... Fuck! We lost a few of the civilians, and Vigo, and a few others... It's really bad in here right now, Command. We're going to need all the help we can get. We... Munru. Where's Anru? She... Oh. She was behind us. Where is she? Don't worry about that now. We're marking an extraction point on your visor. The extraction team is waiting for you there. We're going to get you all out. The group hurries towards the extraction point as the site continues to collapse around them. Above ground. Aerial surveillance captures footage of large sections of the site sliding into the ground, and smoke beginning to bellow from the power station and nearby mechanical facilities. Jets of flame become visible as the earth beneath SCP-1730 begins to give way. Mobile Task Force Alpha-20, Holy Divers, enters the site near the crumbling power station. The group of survivors comes into view, and are immediately moved towards the access point, and then away from the site by members of MTF A20. As the rest of the task force members are pulled away from the site, a separate transmission reaches site command, originating from T5 Anru. Anru and Hollis are standing in front of the Thresher device, which roars with activity behind them. They are firing their weapons at an encroaching black mass in front of them, which is punctuated by streaks of fire. In the background, the Servine entity can be seen tearing through long tendrils with its antlers, as rods of flaming metal streak across the room towards the leech-like entity. Hollis turns towards the cameras visibly laughing, firing their weapon openly. Hollis has removed their helmet, 
The hum of the machine behind them grows noticeably louder, eventually overtaking all sounds in the room. Streaks of electricity arc across the ceiling above them. Hollis smiles and turns towards Anru, who looks down to find their torso has been destroyed by a jet of flames. As Anru slumps to the side, the last shot is of Hollis, laughing hysterically and wildly firing her weapons, as the enormous machine behind them begins to glow bright white. There is a flash, and the transmission ends. Outside, as MTF A20 continues to move researchers and personnel to safety, there's a deafening crackling sound, and a large hum fills the air. The area around the site begins to visibly distort, as if being seen through water. And then, suddenly, SCP-1730 is gone. In its place is an immense crater over one kilometer in diameter. No other transmissions are received from within the site, and no other anomalous activity is detected.